Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to the education channel of the New Books Network. I'm your host, Tom DeSena, from the Department of Communication, Journalism, and Public Relations at Oakland University. My guest today is Joshua Price, the author of Just Work for All, The American Dream in the 21st Century. Just Work for All is a book about the American dream, how to understand the central principle of American public philosophy, the ways in which it is threatened by a number of winner-take-all economic trends, and how to make it a reality for workers and their families in the 21st century. Integrating political philosophy and the history of political thought with recent work in economics, political science, and sociology, this book calls for renewed political and policy commitment to just work. My guest today is Joshua Price, is a professor of philosophy and director of philosophy, politics, and economics at Minnesota State University, Mankato. His research is in social and political philosophy, political economy, applied ethics, and the philosophy of economics. His work can be found in such journals as European Journal of Political Theory, Philosophy and Social Criticism, Social Theory and Practice, Basic Income Studies, and Critical Review of International Social and Political Philosophy. For the academic year 2016-2017, Price was an Associate Professor of Political Theory at Brown University and is on the editorial board of Business Ethics Quarterly. Joshua Price, welcome to the New Books Network. Thanks, Tom. It's a great pleasure to be here. So you begin Just Work for All with the economic consequences of the pandemic, which at the time of publication had really just begun. Um, And you use the economic contraction caused by COVID to highlight the degree to which our contemporary circumstances fall short of not just the American dream, but even for some of the hopes that people once had for the future of work. So I want to start our conversation today with uh, the Jetsons. (laughs) Um, What does this uh, seemingly innocuous television show from the early 60s have to tell us about work in the 21st century? Well, uh, in some some ways, uh, not not that much, uh, as I argue, but uh, I I make this uh, distinction, but I have this title, which I'm uh, sort of pleased with. Uh, being someone who uh, watched way too much uh, television as a young child, and that meant Judson's uh, episodes. Um, I have this, uh, as you know, the section in the intro uh, on called The Jetsons and James Mead. And I, I contrast uh, uh, the work of James Mead on, you know, sort of his, his worries, his predictions about uh, how, you know, wealthier societies are going to continue to develop as they continue to adopt uh uh, you, I guess, li- automation or labor replacing technologies, and what happens? And of course, he hasn't uh, um, hasn't uh, uh, read the contemporary economists uh, like uh, Dorone Simoglu and others that I talk about in the book. But this sort of wondering whether or not uh, the uh, the economy will reinstate uh, displaced labor, and if they do, uh, how they'll be reinstated? Will they uh, will they continue to command? Uh, you know, a a share of the fruits of economic growth, or will they, in his view, his worry, I should say, he's generally optimistic, but his worry is without adapting public policy, what's going to happen is you're going to get a relatively small collection of really wealthy uh, capital owners and uh, a lot of the sort of middle class labor uh, of the mid 20th century, uh, employment will get displaced um, and get moved to uh, sort of low productivity, low wage uh, service sector. Right. Um, the Jetsons, by contrast, uh, has a different vision of the future. Um, it's a it's it's a vision of the future where uh, the fruits of economic growth are more or less equally shared. Right. So you have George Jetson, uh, a kind of a, a working class stiff uh, in in the show. Right. It's, it's very clear that he's not uh, an executive. He's not one of the uh, he's not in the commanding heights of the economy. He's you know kind of a you know he he, he drives his compact uh, saucer. Uh, to and from work, um, he, he's always worried about his little uh, domestic appliances. Him and Jane are worried about their domestic appliances breaking down, so they don't have a, a ton of wealth, right? But actually, they don't work very much. Uh, their future looks a little bit like the most positive uh, sort of story that, like someone like Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, would say, which is, you know, as automation continues, is is technology keeps making these basic uh, tasks obsolete. What we're going to get, uh, uh, what what might happen, and of course Keynes is worried about things that might happen to prevent this from going this way too, is what you'll get is uh, lots more leisure time. 
uh, you'll get uh, someone that's, whose schedule looks a lot more like uh, George and Jane Jetson's. They put in a couple hours of work a week, a uh, day, um, uh, and they have a broadly secure. I mean, he's always worried that uh, that uh, Mr. Spacely will hire them, but you don't really get, uh, fire him. But you don't really get any sense that uh, that uh, that uh, if he was fired, that he wouldn't be able to find a similar uh, employment. So you get you get in other words you get sort of an extrapolation of what in many ways was the lived experience of people at the time when uh, the Jetsons was being produced and uh, distributed, which is that you had several decades of broad based uh, inclusive economic growth. Right, you didn't have an egalitarian society in the sense that people were equally wealthy or powerful. Far from it, um, but nonetheless, people up and down sort of the in- wealth and income ladders. Uh, saw comparable increases in their standard of living. And as a result, uh, people up and down these ladders were able to uh, translate, if you will, productivity gains into uh, into uh, more stuff, you know, better quality of life, higher life expectancy, and, uh, and, and more leisure time, right? And so in a way, the Jetsons is a vision of the future where um, technological change keeps pushing us in that direction, the direction where we do less and less and less and less work uh, because the machines do it for us. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it, the gains from uh, that growth are more or less egalitarian in the sense that they're widely shared, right? So that's sort of the vision of the future. There's all sorts of problems with that vision of the future, uh, as I talk about in chapter uh, four and five in particular, uh, it's that the Jetsons is not a model of an ideally just society uh, or anything like that. But one thing that is sort of like positive about it is, again, that th- this uh, this widely shared growth leads to comparable gains. And that means we all sort of like, you know, again, translate our work into a middle class life and we have to work less as a result of technological advancement. So in the first chapter, you draw a distinction between what you call a Smithian well-ordered society and our current condition of a winner-take-all society. Can you describe what you mean by these two terms and the consequences for seemingly having adopted one version over the other? Yeah, uh, good question. Yeah. So the distinction between a Smithian well-ordered society and a winner-take-all society you know, as I, as I put it in the book, you know, we're 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 uh, transitioning. We in, in the American context, but solely not in the American text, we're looking less and less like the Smithian well-ordered society. Which is not to say that we ever were a perfectly Smithian well-ordered society, or even that a Smithian well-ordered society is the ideal uh, of justice. Like it's a complete, uh, print, you know, ideal of justice that encompasses everything we care about. But one thing the Smith and well Smithian well-ordered society does capture is this idea that you know, and, and again, fundamental in Adam Smith's uh, arguments for uh, the adoption of market institutions uh, and the reform and the rejection of mercantilist and feudalist institutions, um, the reason why markets are to be favored. One sort of aspect of this Smithian Waller society is it's a, it's a society with rapid economic growth. Now, just work, as I talk about it, for that principle to be put into practice, it doesn't depend upon rapid economic growth. But a Smithian Weller society is a rapid, uh, uh, rapidly uh, growing society, uh, ec- economy uh, that becomes increasingly more productive, right? But the sort of moral core of Smith is not, uh, you know, great gains to growth or productivity in a distributive, insensitive sort of way. Central to uh, Smith and really most uh, sort of philosophers who are sort of, you know, sort of the historical genesis of what came to be known as the modern discipline of economics, right? Smith is often thought of as, as, as the founding father of the discipline of economics. Um, the, the central sort of like the normative core here for Smith is the elevation of the working poor, right? So a Smithian welfare society is a society where uh, people who, who possess and act according to market specific virtues, people who are willing to work hard, people who are prudent, uh, people who are creative, innovative, these people will see their uh, their labor, as he puts it, liberally rewarded, right? So a Smithian welfare society can be a society that has a lot of economic inequality per se, but it's, it's one in a society where economic inequality doesn't get to the levels where it, uh, where he is concerned it will corrupt um, these sort of uh, the virtues that make uh, markets function well, right? But it's also a society where um, 
where where the gains to economic growth are uh, more or less uh, equitable in the sense that you might you know to use a particular way with it a rising tide is is effectively uh, lifting all boats right so that's a Smithian well order society in mid century uh, United States um, you know and I talk about you know I I use this idea of a Smithian well order society to capture a wide range of work uh, in, in, uh, in political economy, ec- economics, economic history uh, to capture a number of different trends. And there's a lot of disputes as to, uh, you know, which of what's the primary sources, you know, is it primary uh, labor displacement that's going on? Is it primarily worker decline in bargaining power and union power? I don't particularly enter into that debate, or rather, I should say, a Smithian Weller society could say, okay, whatever the reasons, start from there anyway. Um, we're going from a society that increase that is does not again follow this pattern of the Jetsons, right? Where uh, you know we don't have this where the gains are are more or less widely shared, and you know again, and not only that, but uh, where workers can expect a better life for themselves in general, right? You have a uh, in the people born in the 1940s, for example, uh, you know, recent work by economists Raj Chetty and others, you know, had you know it's absolute mobility, the ability to do better off than your parents were at a comparable age, uh, you know, peaked at 90%. And right now it's at or below 50%, depending on how you read the data, right? So this is a society where uh, honest, good, you know, hard work was well rewarded, right? And a winner-take-all society, by contrast, right, or the winner-take-all trends uh, I describe are trends in political economy, you know, and again, I, I say political economy because I'm not dissociating the politics from the economics of it. Right, these trends these trends are uh, found in a wide range of different places with very different political histories. Right, so they are you know in in a sense sort of trends that a lot of different countries are dealing with. Right, but but the extent to which they they are dealing with them and the way they are characterized is, is due a lot in terms of the political decisions um, that these countries are made. So these trends in political economy instead are creating a society where the fruits of economic growth are increasingly. Uh, you know, you would you might say captured or go to, uh, are claimed by, are reserved by, uh, increasingly small. I reason why I don't say captured is because it need not necessarily have a nefarious explanation, right? Winner take all markets can sometimes just reward people who are particularly excellent, right? But the nature of these winner take all markets, right? And again, and, and, you know, I talk about you know a variety of trends from labor polarization to uh, to this, to the winner or take all our superstar markets in a, in a kind of more technical sense. But in these markets, uh, you know, small differences in luck, small differences in uh, skill, small differences in effort, small differences in connection, who got there first um, can make a massive difference in people's reward. So instead of getting a society uh, the, where you know that the fruits of econ- that for people who are willing to work hard can you know claim a share of the fruits of economic growth, you increasingly get a society where much of that economic growth is uh, is again captured by the top, and you get a kind of uh, hollowing out of the middle class. Right, exactly, and you and in combination with the hollowing out of the middle class, you get uh, I talk about security as well, so you get sort of. Uh, you get this sort of widespread, pervasive sense of uh, sense and real sense of security, where people are living paycheck to paycheck, um, and, and so on. And so that's this, you know, in a in a kind of like a in, in brief, that's the transition here, right? You're getting this, uh, and, and you know, lots of different data talk about it, but these two sort of frames are a way of sort of uh, I don't know ideal types that 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 then enable me in the rest of the text to think through what the implications for these are uh, according to how we ought to think about justice, which, you know, which principles of justice are most compelling, most important in this context, and also what the, the if you will, the, the sort of normative crisis in contemporary political economy is. So that becomes sort of the background for that discussion. Yeah. And, and that leads us to the, the second chapter. And here you describe the, uh, something you call the American public philosophy of markets. And I'd like you to explain to our listeners what is included in this public philosophy of mar- of markets, and perhaps even more importantly, what doesn't seem to be a part of the American public's belief system in regards to how markets are supposed to function. Yeah, and and, and if, if it's okay, I might actually take kind of a, a second to uh, 
to talk about the methodology, uh, you know, I, you, say, you say it's an American public philosophy of markets. You know, a, a part of what goes on in chapter two, and I talk about it in chapter six uh, and elsewhere in the book, too, is, you know, I have a particular sort of vi- meaning or vision for what I'm trying to accomplish as, as, a, as a, a public philosophy. And the reason why I'm going to sort of uh, talk a bit methodologically about that uh, is in part because th- then it informs uh, my use of engagement with uh, the, you know, the political science and sociology of American beliefs and why it's so important. So there might be a kind of way of thinking about what we should be doing here is to say, like, look, it's not particularly, it doesn't particularly matter um, what most people believe. Most people may believe all sorts of really erroneous or conflicting things. You know, I should, one should present a vision of justice that everyone should believe, right? Whereas my, to, to use the, you know, to use the language that a philosopher might use, my, my account's internal or internalist in a certain sense, right? I work through my idea of public philosophy um, is to is to kind of work through uh, the views uh, that I find, right? To take the state of the art of, of people's conceptions of what matters uh, with respect to economic justice broadly conceived and, and, and to challenge those to a certain extent and to see what they work out, but to, to again, to kind of, to, to, to meet my uh, sort of fellow citizens where they are. And there's a number of reasons why I do that, um, uh, you know, in the book, but I can, you know, we can talk a little bit less about that perhaps right now and sort of move on to what this American public philosophy of markets is, right? So doing public philosophy, you know, part of what makes it public in my sense is that it's rooted in widely shared beliefs uh, and concerns. Um, and with respect to the public philosophy of markets in the contemporary United States, um, I address, I guess you might say, two ways of thinking about it that I don't think are particularly accurately reflected in the way, uh, two ways that sometimes people characterize American public philosophy of markets. One, that that we're primarily or exclusively concerned with something like a fair equality of opportunity or what I call fair rights. You know, um, that is this this idea that, you know, justice just is. Um, you know, uh, kind of like something like a level starting playing field, kind of like an equal starting gate. Um, and Americans, unlike sometimes this is the character, right? Caricature. Uh, Americans, unlike maybe some people in continental uh, Europe, are less concerned with inequality per se and more con- concerned with inequality of opportunity, understood again in this fair race sense of the term. Um, another is that Americans don't really care about inequality. Uh, you know, um, in part because uh, they have a kind of, uh, uh, Leslie McCall calls this kind of, you know, she calls it when she's characterizing it. She doesn't think this is a primary American belief. Um, this bootstraps idea, uh, you know, that we can pull our, we should be able to pull ourselves by our own bootstraps. So a lot of way of talking about American beliefs about inequality is based on scholarship and, and readings and survey data from a broadly Smithian well-ordered society context, right? So you get a context in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and and into the early 80s where people experienced and more or less believed um, that equitable growth was kind of how markets worked. Um, And so in this context, uh, it's natural that they would be more inclined to be convinced by either uh, sort of fair quality of opportunity, sort of a uh, it's an meritocratic value, uh, <clears throat> or um, or again this bootstraps value because their reality is such that uh, that's what they were seeing. Like if someone wa- was in in a context of SWO, ideally speaking, um, in that idealist example, someone is able to translate hard work into a better uh, life for themselves. So if you look at um, their beliefs in this situation, that's that's what you're going to see. Um, but in fact. Um, Americans do uh, care about inequality, but they care about it not necessarily in a way that captured that is always captured well by analytic political philosophers. Even uh, even when they're talking about uh, what, uh, even when they're claiming to present a view that captures widespread values. Uh, in particular, you know, the Americans aren't so concerned with is a luck egalitarian. So luck egalitarian. In, 
in the language of political philosophy is a term that uh, Elizabeth Anderson used and she in a critical work to characterize a wide range of uh, theorists who hold, held very different or held different beliefs about justice but this basic idea that a just society is one where people get what they deserve uh, meaning what they're responsible for so Americans recognize by and large that inequal- inequalities might not reflect effort and marriage right? Um, they're not con- con- concerned that inequalities, uh, within the inequalities that are the product of unequal talent, right? So they're not, they're not seeking, uh, you know, this neutralization of everything that people are not responsible for. Um, what they're most concerned about, what I remain convinced that is essential, compelling, is these inequalities become a problem when you go further and further from something like a Smithian well or society. That is when you, you know, insofar as, insofar as people at the top are able to distance themselves from the rest of society in a way such that they're doing, they're getting the fruits of growth, whereas other people are not, or insofar as in times of crisis, they're able to isolate themselves and they profit while everyone else suffers. That's when Americans get particularly upset about inequality. Uh, that is, they see it as a kind of violation of how market societies are supposed to work. That is, they that is, insofar as a rising tide is lifting all boats, you know, that CEOs make more if it's not completely distant is not a particular concern right. because it's they can okay. be they can, yeah they can be seen as good shepherds of economic growth, if you will. Right? They take on this responsibility. They're better suited for these towns. They make more. Fine. That that's fine. But insofar as that those group of people are able to separate themselves, insofar as they're able to profit even when others are 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 getting increasingly less secure uh, and stagnating, that's when they tend to be particularly um, concerned, right? And so that doesn't particularly capture, you know, either a luck egalitarian reading of American political culture or a libertarian reading of political culture, which uh, you know says something like, "Hey, look." you know, the job of society, you know, libertarian political philosophy can sometimes seem to capture widespread views in American public philosophy of markets, in part because Americans in general have this widespread skepticism of of, of the use of government power built in there, right? Um, and so it can seem like that, but in fact, no, they hold something very uh, different than that as well. Can you describe that a little bit more, just the, the idea the, of, of the, the libertarian streak? Oh, okay. Yeah. So when I discuss libertarianism in, in the book uh, and, and in a couple earlier uh, papers, um, so I, I look at I look at this, uh, I look at it through the lens of personal responsibility. So and I, and I look at a, a set of libertarian theorists, particularly I look at um, um, David Schmitz. Or I, you could call them libertarian. You call them classical liberal. Uh, F.A. Hayek. And then uh, and then, of course, uh, Robert Nozick. Right. All of these people wrote very sophisticated uh, works in political philosophy. All of these people, um, you know, had insights. Uh, but their work, one thing that sort of one broad sort of overlap in their work in this context is a certain sort of uh, insensitivity to um, to forms of distributive or opportunity injustice. Right. And uh, and and I argue like and and. What's the problem with like that? Well, as a standalone system, um, you know, I don't, I don't argue per se um, that, that uh, against what either of these theorists propose, kind of in an abstraction, right? But in the context of American public philosophy that has this broadly Smithian understanding of how markets can and should work, you can get a lot of disastrous consequences by passing public policy uh, in, in libertarian terms. Uh, and part of the reason why this can happen um, is because there might appear to be a natural overlap, and indeed, sort of, this was often called by uh, by Buckley and other sort of thinkers as a kind of conservative libertarian fusionism. Right? There might appear to be a kind of uh, political and philosophical overlap between meritocratic conservatives, right? You know, who say like, look. Uh, you know, who are objecting to welfare state or social democratic policies because they're taking for people who deserve something and giving it to people who haven't, either because they're unwilling to work or 
whatever, right? So now libertarian thought gives us all sorts of reasons to question this meritocratic concern, right? Uh, you know, uh, you know, and I, in fact, Hayek is going to say, you know, basically that's just false uh, to think that that's how markets work. Markets don't track merit in that sense of the word, in that normative sense. And then Schmitz himself is going to redefine merit in a way that's sort of opportunity insensitive is in the book, as I describe in the book. So the fusionism, it's not an actual uh, philosophical overlap. But they might still recommend the same principles because the the conservatives believe wrongly um, that uh, that uh, that they that they further merit in, in, in these sort of ways. Uh, but and then the libertarians also affirm them because they're not concerned with uh, merit in these sorts of ways at all. Um, and the the problem from a libertarian public philosophy then is dealing with the negative externalities of this affirmation. Right. In a context in a context where people hold the sort of political moral views that look more like Smith's and less like Hayek's. Right. Um, uh, that is where they where they generally tend to think that markets reward virtue and that people who fail to do well in markets do so because they lack a certain set of virtues. Right. Hayek can tell us all sorts of reasons why markets aren't meant to capture virtue in that way. But if most citizens believe that markets capture virtue in right, that way, they do. then the Paul. Right. Yes. Now, policies that hold them accountable uh, to their actions right. are going. All sorts of people who are not unvirtuous are going to be judged as unvirtuous. Right. They're going, and that's going yes. to condition all sorts of things that the libertarian would think is terrible, like you know the, the extreme examples: forcing people to pee in their cup to get welfare benefits, or you know, back in the day right. to have have people go up, show up at single mothers' houses and make sure that they weren't uh, illicitly having affairs yeah, in front right. of their children. Um, and all sorts of other uh, things that a libertarian can, any thoughtful libertarian, you, know, you have this distinction between like libertarian political yeah. philosophy proper and people who might call themselves libertarians in the American public sphere, but don't really hold much of anything like a libertarian public philosophy. Totally fine with locking up, uh, you know, immigrants, for example, or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Something, you know, a libertarian is going to be a pro open borders. Uh, these someone. Right. Who, yeah, right. So there's all sorts of, but. But, but the politician might, still, might not be. Right. The politician might very much not be, uh, even though they call themselves a libertarian. Anyway, that issue aside, um, the negative externalities of having this political cult of applying preferred libertarian policies in a political culture where people don't believe anything like a libertarian reality about what hap- how markets work can be really problematic for those reasons. But it also can fail to address all the other sort of negative externalities uh of a of a winner take all society and 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 among others you know just to kind of you know without going through a laundry list of the stuff i talk about it among others this you know rapid rise in what you know ann case and ann case and angus even called deaths of despair right this uh these people who these pe- people living in communities of prolonged you know lack of economic opportunity uh uh such that you know declining hope for themselves or for their children and and, and which case and Deaton link uh to uh rising uh suicide and rising uh use of drugs and, and case and Deaton here are sort of like this this is often you know happening more and more in you know rural or you know suburban formerly suburban you know think uh, Dayton Ohio or different parts of the yeah, Rust yeah, yeah. Belt United States sure. Right, it happening increasingly to, uh, to 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 white Americans, but of course, a similar phenomenon could you know, uh, William Julius Wilson, yeah, just a generation earlier, right? You know, his work, you know, like so, you know, Wilson has this great, uh, uh, you know, sort of series of works on what happens when work disappears, right? And a lot of the uh, a lot of the African American populations in particular, I mean, populations in general, but disproportionately representing an African-American workers, uh, you know, people who, you know, migrated to the North for industrial jobs, what happens when these middle-class jobs uh, leave, right? You get, you get the similar, you get the same sort of thing, right? And in fact, um, much of what you're seeing uh, in this, you know, case, case and Deaton talk about, you know, you actually had, and of course, since COVID, we've actually had another couple of years of declining life expectancy. But even pre-COVID, you had something which was really almost unheard of in a wealthy developed country like the United States, which is actually declining life expectancy. And this was almost exclusively the product of these rising deaths of despair among middle-aged uh, 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 white communities. 
Um, and but you had the same phenomenon hitting African American communities a generation earlier. Although one one notable difference is that African Americans don't really commit suicide in the same way that white Americans were. Um, but uh, but there were uh, you know you had these similar things happen, right? It, you, you need uh, opportunity and distributive sensitive public philosophy to fully address that. I mean, I think a certain sort of libertarian might just say, no, you just get a perfectly competitive market. You get actually Smith's sort of neoclassical vision right, and you won't have to worry about it. Um, right. Right. One, that doesn't. Everything will just fall into really, place. Yeah. Right. And even if you believe that's true, though, of course, that's not the way uh, political economy works. That's not the way the theory of practice of justice works. You don't just get to stipulate your ideal. You have to stipulate incremental changes. You have to stipulate political you have to talk about political, whatever. And libertarians have, you know, a lot, there's lots of really smart libertarian thinkers out here talk about these things. But nonetheless, for those reasons I just argued, this philosophy is just really poorly suited to an increasingly winner-take-all society. Um, you know, and so if nothing else, libertarians need to address, you know, I say rule number one for a libertarian public philosophy is to sort of pound on the table and say, no, 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 poor people aren't poor because they deserve it. Wealthy people aren't wealthy because they deserve it. Right. It has nothing to do with dessert or very little to do uh, with what they deserve in any normative sense. Now, most libertarians won't do that, um, I argue, or I worry um, wh for a variety of reasons. One reason is they might be concerned that, hey, if you start undermining this myth of meritocracy, you might invite all sorts of left wing politics that we don't want. Right. So, you know, you got to keep the barbarians uh, at the gate, as it were, of the people who who uh, who are already looking for ways to upset markets. And you got to keep them at bay. And one way to keep them at bay and one way to motivate them, Hayek believes, is, is to, if, is it's fine if they believe something largely false, which is how well off they do as a result of their efforts. But if they believe their efforts make them better off, then they're likely to work harder. And that'll be better for everybody, right? A kind of false ideology, if you will. And I talk about the problems with that anyway. That's probably enough on that particular, uh, that topic, but, uh, but that, that's the issue. I think we, we, we got in there pretty good. Yes, we did. So let's talk for a minute. You've already you've already brought up the idea of the fair race, uh, and I want to talk about it in relation to uh, sort of the central feature of your book, which is this idea of the American dream. And obviously, there's a lot that can be sort of folded into the idea of the American dream. Um, you focus on two ideas: the as we mentioned before, fair race and just work. Um, talk a little bit about both of these, and and the relationship to to the standard of the American dream. Good. Okay. So the fair race conception, again, just to sort of rehearse it uh, very quickly, the fair race conception is broadly speaking a level, level playing field, right? And so I have this kind of, I give this, uh, uh, the one of the epigraphs in chapter uh, three, I actually have a Paul Ryan epigraph. So he says, uh, uh, what is it? And and, and, he, and he, he made this uh, sort of argument is, he, he wanted to paint uh, Barack Obama as, uh, is a is a equality of result person rather than equality of opportunity person, and he said so. He you know he wrote justice is done when we level the playing field at the starting line, and rewards are proportionate to effort and merit. Uh, and whereas others might say you know uh, you know uh, your career open to your talents or to best fully realize your talents. So one half of you know James Truslow Adams famously coined this concept of the American dream right one half of this is that we'll be able to achieve the, the most we can with our talents so one sort of widely held uh, part of the American dream as a public philosophy and sometimes the American dream in certain discourses just gets reduced to this um, is this idea that you know hey look unlike these you know these sort of uh, old wealthy sort of hierarchical societies the United States uh, America is a country where you can make it if you try uh, and make it if you try means that, you know, everybody has a more or less fair shot um, at, uh, at getting what, what they want. Positions of privilege, positions of, you know, a good life for themselves and their family and so on. Right. And so the problem from a justice perspective, then, is all the sorts of inequalities of opportunities that can undermine this fair competition. Right? Another idea that also is found in the American dream, right? I talk about the American dream as a kind of organizing concept for a lot of different principles of justice. Another central conception is this idea of just work. Um, and a just work uh, principle says, uh, you know, reflects the dignity. Uh, it's a principle that's more concerned with the dignity of work and the people uh, who perform it, right? So uh, the principle of just work then you know, is is one where um, individuals 
you know, it, it's not reducible to the idea of a Smithian well-ordered society, but it's it's a kind of relational principle in the sense that uh, a just work society is one where workers' uh, welfare and status is, if you will, befitting uh, the contributions they make, not in a marginal productivity sense, but in a way that respects sort of the fund, as, as uh, Martin Luther King would put it, um, the fundamental uh, dignity of work, right? So, it, it, yeah, so in a, in a growing society, this would mean that uh, people who are willing to work hard uh, uh, will, will gain a share of the fruits of economic growth, you know, in a, in a stagnant society that they, you know, that they will, they will be able to, in some broad sense, uh, relate to their uh, fellow citizens uh, as free and equal. So, right. So lurking in this uh, idea of just work is, is this sort of fundamental belief in American public philosophy of markets, which is that people should be able to exchange hard work for, broadly speaking, a middle-class life. And a middle-class life is one uh, with a context relative, you know, the way you think about it is a context relative set of wages, but it also c- concerns status and security. Um, and, and Americans are also historically, like literally from day one, concerned with domination, right? So there's this long-standing trend in American public philosophy, um, sometimes gets in contemporary political theory, gets gets put it into either relational egalitarian views or neo-Republican conceptions, right? Uh, where, you know, a, a fr- you, we should be able to relate to our fellow citizens in free, as free and equal. And this means that we are not in some sense subject to their dominating power over us. So, right. So the, the idea of just work actually act, captures this, that concern as well, that, uh, that a just work society is one where workers are not, you know, they have to follow orders in the workplace um, in order to get the job done right in a hierarchical structure, but there's a way in which they can still relate to even their employers, even their managers uh, uh, as free and equal persons. Right. So that's, that's the, the core understanding of just work. Um, it's not, uh, how best to put it, it's unlike uh, fair race, it, it is, it's, it's distribution sensitive in a way that fair race is not. Right. It's so not, you have to, right. you have to fundamentally ask not only was the game fair, but what are the results of the game insofar as a game is a good way of thinking. about it. So that's the distinction and, that's going there. So, it, and you mentioned in that, in that discussion, uh, Dr. King, um, where, which brings us to the the fourth chapter of your book, where we where you bring up uh, the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, um, and and I'd like you to talk a little bit about um, you know people sometimes forget uh, how important economic justice was to Dr. King. Right. Well, let me let me kind of fold one of the things I talk about in chap at the end of chapter three uh, together with uh, with with the with here because you might say you know I, I say this is a work of public philosophy you know in a way uh, Martin Luther King is sort of the most prominent most influential public philosopher uh, you know uh, it, it, that I that I address in the sense he, he, in a way you might say he's the most influential public philosopher in the United States but one time sometimes when you, when people think about him um, uh, you, you 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 get the uh, certain segments of the I have a dream uh, speech taken in uh, isolation from his broader concern with uh, the dignity uh, of work. Um, but let's talk for a second about this distinction between fair race and just work, and then, I'll, and then we'll uh, replay it through uh, King's conception of the ends of the civil rights movement. So one of the central things I argue in the text is that uh, while both just work and fair race are core constituents of American public philosophy, and our conception of the American dream, they take on different levels of import in different contexts, right? So in a Smith, broadly Smithian well-ordered society, you know, much of what people are concerned with in the con, in the, under the, if you will, principle of just work um, are largely met by the structure of that political economy itself, right? Generally speaking, uh, you know, people who are willing to har- work hard can expect a better life for themselves. You know, as Barack Obama puts it, America is the place where, uh, where uh, hard work is a ticket to the middle class and you can make it in your tr- if you try, right? The middle class, again, being this right. context, 
sensitive uh, understanding of wages right. and benefits and status and so on. Right. So in the context of Smithian yeah, role, future. Just, right. But that still might be a society like mid-century United States society that was radically unjust from the perspective of fair rate, right? Where all sorts of people had far greater opportunity and lots of people were very much shut out um, of, you know, reaching higher, 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 higher is a, not, not in an intrinsic sense, but th- there are lots of opportunities that were, that were closed off, right? Uh, on, you know, on the basis of race and gender, but class as well. But in the context of Smithian and Weller society, where just work is more easily realizable in the nature of the institutions, it makes sense for our public philosophy to start keep poking on, to keep trying to address those concerned with justice, those concerned with the American dream, to engage with, to try and address um, uh, obstacles to fair race and to, and to level the playing field. But in the context of a, uh, of a winner-take-all society, you know, in a winner-take-all society, even if you level... Even if you level the playing field, you're going to still end up with a context in which uh, large segments of the population are just simply left behind. Um, uh, you're, you, in the context of a winning, winner take all society, uh, even if everybody gets a fair shot, narrow differences and talent and effort and networks are going to uh, are going to lead to uh, all sorts of issues with just work. Right. So in in that context. In our current context, we have a lot more reason to give priority to uh, this idea of just work. And not only that, but when we when we connect the, if you will, the the philosophy and the economics to the politics, right? Um, you know, even if you think that a just society is one where uh, everybody gets a fair shot, in a winner take all society, the uh, the the economics of a winner-take-all society is going to keep undermining fair race, right? People who win are going to win a lot, and they're going to use that winnings to close off opportunities, to give their children opportunities that other people don't, right? Whereas in a Smithian, whereas in a Smithian well-ordered society or something that approaches that, when, when the fruits of gain are more widely shared, right, people have less incentive to uh, opportunity hoard, as it's sometimes said. Okay. So with that transformation, with that, you know, sort of focusing on uh, just work inside, I, I argue then in turn that uh, way of thinking about King's ends of the civil rights movement, but also uh, one of the central challenges uh, for racial justice uh, in the United States um, is should be thought of in terms of just work, right? And this is not to deny that issues of fair race are important. You know, I raised this distinction that uh, that Nancy Fraser uh, talks about between this paradigm of recognition and this uh, paradigm of uh, redistribution, right? And so in no way do I or King deny that recognition is really important. In fact, it's crucial. You know, I have lots of quotes from King uh, in the book regarding just how important it is to status and so on and so forth, right? But one problem we might face is if we reduce... Uh, is if we only focus on recognition, or if we treat redistribution, issues of redistribution is fundamentally a, 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 the product of misrecognition or malrecognition. Because what is, what's going, a big part of what's going on in contemporary political economy is that African-American gains to, uh, gains in terms of op- educational fulfillment and opportunity, uh, in terms of status recognition, right, are being swamped in many cases by winner-take-all trends. And this is precisely what King was concerned with, right? The second sort of stage of the civil rights movement, as he thought about it, a stage which he thought would be harder, right? So the first first stage, you know, he says, we more, you know, more widespread voting rights, um, you know, the ability to, you know, eat at the same lunch counter. These are really central to thinking about how to relate to your citizens in free and equal, as I would say. Um, right, but they're in a way got on the cheap, right? They didn't require too many people to sacrifice resources to get there. In fact, they might, if you're more wise right, yeah. about how economies work, they actually probably right. help. They write, you know, uh, societies that integrate tend to do better economically, right? So it's in right. fact, in, broadly speaking, uh, in people's economic interest, in fact, to 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 go with some of these civil rights things. But that's not necessarily the case with respect to this sort of second stage, right? So his so King's political economy then is largely this this idea that that 
because African Americans are, for a wide range of historical reasons, disproportionately among the relatively unskilled, less educated workers, and, and because of changes in the economy, he's like Mead. Uh, concerned that uh, that technological change will not produce inclusive prosperity, but instead will uh, uh, replace labor and not reinstate them. I'm, I'm importing some language uh, onto King there, but that's broadly the concern. Um, that that organized labor and labor movements and uh, and people concerned with racial justice, the ends of the civil rights movement, these people have to get together. Uh, in part because neither of them independently is going to be powerful enough to bring about the kind of change that he thinks is necessary, right? Um, so the end of the civil rights movement is not just uh, a fair race society where race doesn't matter with respect to equal opportunity. It's a society where, um, where broadly speaking, work in the dignity of workers, regardless of race, uh, is, is well respected. Uh, and, and is well recognized. And then he proposes a number of reforms, some of which look like some of the reforms I propose uh, uh, in chapter seven. But that's his conception of the ends. And one of the brilliant things about King's public philosophy here is that the his his normativity here, his his conception of the ends of civil rights movement, you know, correlates with the sort of political, the sort of the politics that would be necessary in order to make those ends realizable. Right. So there's a kind of really there's a really nice internal link between um, his conception of economic justice and the po- politics necessary. Now, of course, that politics didn't develop in a, in a way when he was writing, uh, you know, the, the, you know, uh, in the late 60s, that, that might have been like the ultimate, the ultimate uh, of, uh, of the of the getting together of organized labor uh, in the civil rights movement, uh, rather than just the, what he hoped, which was just the starting point of working together. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's a big, so, so King's work in his, his writings, his speeches, you know, provide both some of the normative core, but also help me think about, um, what the, what the political reality of a uh, just work society would look like. And that's also, um, this, I think that also can lead to a discussion, uh, about gender. Um, there's obviously a long history of reflections on, uh, matters of economic justice in the <laughs> feminist tradition. And, and you return us briefly here to the Jetsons to discuss um, the, the division of la- the gender division of labor. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so the Jetsons are not our ideal. The world of the Jetsons is a world where broadly speaking uh, gains in uh, technological innovation uh, are, are leading people to, to broadly share gains in prosperity. It's also a world where you don't see people of color anywhere, basically. Um, and it's also a world where you have this extremely rigid gender division of labor. All right. Um, so there might be this kind of sense of if someone's like talking about some of the, the positives of mid-century, 20th century economy, that I might be like, if, if you really quickly read the book or a, a synopsis of it or something like that, you might say like, well, he's just clamoring for the good old days. But the good old days were really terrible in a lot of ways, right? Um, with all these hierarchies. And so a central core end of the book and the the main subject of chapter four and chapter five uh, on race and on gender is to note that in fact, these winner take all trends uh, are, are if anything, uh, you know, be, you know, more important to tackle from the perspective of those concerned with racial and gender um, justice. Now, Gender, of course, the nature of it is a phenomenon. It doesn't intersect or overlap with class in the way that race does, right? Um, but none, and so the the winner take all trends have less of an impact uh, on gender. And in fact, at the same time, societies become increasingly winner take all has been a, a, a time when you've seen you know sort of unprecedented gains in women's workforce partic- participation, um, relative earnings, and so on. So there can be this sort of belief that the, the problem is really like a white work, a white male problem. Um, what, but of course, women disproportionately make up uh, the large, the, 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 what, you know, Mead calls the, you know, the low, the, the low productivity service sector, right? Low wage workers are disproportionately uh, women workers. Yeah, um, the, the folks being hit by, by the, by COVID right now, right? The, and then, are, and, are, right. Yeah, and then um, in particular, women uh, and people yeah, of color. 
exactly. Uh, in particular, uh, you know, you see is, you know, one of the underlying themes throughout the entire book is that COVID is exacerbating these winner take all trends. A couple of, inter- couple of interesting things have happened since I wrote the book, actually, uh, uh, that have changed that short term, but I'm worried about it. it's just a short term thing. But anyway, um, all which is to say, um, tackling these winner take all trends are particularly important, right? Um, and and part of and part of thinking about gender justice in this case then is to, is to think about the the sources of gender justice uh, understood understood in this case uh, uh, of being uh, you know one way of understanding it is in terms of the gender wage gap and what's driving it. Right? Uh, a lot of what's driving it is these winner take all trends. A lot of the existing gender wage gap uh, uh, is is much is more pronounced in occupations. That have a certain set of characteristics. I, so I talk about uh, Claudia Golden's work here, um, and all sorts of reasons why uh, why that's an issue. Um, but a lot of it centers around what might sometimes be called uh, uh, talked about in terms of the mar- uh, the the marriage penalty, right? So right, you get this, and and, and if I use the term marriage, when I've used the term marriage penalty and in, in engagements where there are conservatives involved, they'd be like, "Are you saying you know being a mom is a terrible is not a worthwhile activity or whatever?" Um, and of course, I don't mean anything like that. Uh, and in fact, my uh, political philosophy looks a lot like a philosophy of care um, in terms of what I propose, uh, interestingly enough. But in any event, um, the uh, this, you know, a lot of the inequality that exists is is really a, is inequality between married and married women and men with women of children. Right. So uh, women, unmarried women make 96 percent of uh, the wages of unmarried men. Uh, in most large, uh, in most large urban areas, uh, unmarried women make more than unmarried men. There's lots of complications there in terms of uh, how people select their spouses uh, and selection bias and, and that sort of data and all sorts of things like that. But you get this huge, and Golden talks about this. You get this huge, growing inequality that happens once um, people get married and have children. Right? This, this, the lingering effects of our gender division of labor. Right. So if we're going to address that issue and do so in a way that doesn't trade off with uh, with uh, with other concerns, right? So uh, you know, a pro, if you will, pro uh, gender justice uh, policy um, that doesn't generate other sorts of inequalities. Lots of uh, lots of policies that are meant to address gender justice will actually end up trading off with other versions of equality. But one sort of central proposal, just as a way of kind of summing up the work I do in that chapter, uh, that I make at the end is is publicly funded uh, child care, right? So my central proposal at the end of chapter five, and indeed one of my central policy proposals for the idea of just work in general, um, is publicly uh, provided child care. This, ha- this plays a kind of, and if it's okay, Tom, I'll talk a little bit about how it fits, these things fit together. But uh, it plays a it plays one. It, it's 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 particularly well suited to addressing gender inequality in the workplace, right? Uh, publicly provided childcare. What does it do? Well, the childcare workers are disproportionately women, right? They're disproportionately poorly paid women. Any policy that raises demand for and wages of childcare workers and early childhood educators is going to disproportionately benefit women. It's going to narrow the gender wage gap, right? It's going to if you will, cross redress these policies, right? The availability of publicly provided childcare and high quality childcare will also mitigate many of the uh, sort of inequalities that arise from the so-called marriage penalty, right? Um, right. To, to make this accessible, you, you, you will prevent, if nothing else, an, another choice uh, uh, to people. But it also, publicly provided childcare is not just about gender justice, or anything like it, right? There's all sorts of, you know, you know, again, and of course, you always have to ask any public policy is how well is it put into place? You know, how well is it run and managed, whatever. But there's all sorts of evidence that points to positive gains for children for the availability of equal, uh, the availability of early childhood education, and also that we disproportionately underinvest in early childhood education, right? The people who most benefit from it are kids who don't have any money, right? And the the people who parents are usually younger and have less resources to invest in early childhood education, even if they wanted to, right? Uh, and they're not able to borrow to do it, right? It's, it's not like I can borrow like a student loan and I, then I, and I, I'm better off after having to go to school. I can't do that with my kids, right? So there's all sorts of reasons to believe that as a society, uh, by leaving it as it were to the market, we chronically under-invest in these things. 
but also early childhood education and, and day, daycare for children, free quality available to all, right? If, if it pays well enough, it creates all sorts of middle-class employment for those who might not, who are otherwise scraping by, right? It creates, I had uh, on my uh, pandemic ethics podcast, I had uh, uh, Candice Deal Bartell, an early childhood educator, uh, and we talked about the challenges of providing childcare uh, during the pandemic. Um, but one of the challenges is staffing and getting people to see that providing early childhood early childhood education is not just like what you do before you get a real job, as some say, <laughs> right? Um, yes. But rather to give it a, a middle class employment, right? This, yes. But also the availability of childcare. One of the major challenges um, in a winner take all economy is this geographical polarization. Right. That is, you have some high productivity, relatively high opportunity parts of the United States, and you get lots of islands who are kind of like small islands separated from much of the rest. Right. Um, or just in general, uh, the ability to move to job, you know, like I, the ideal society for no one is a society where people always have to leave their community to get a good job. Right. But nonetheless, the availability of early childhood education and daycare makes it much easier for people to relocate in search of employment, right? Because in order to relocate, you lose access to maybe at least temporarily some friends or family that might have otherwise provided part of this care. It makes it much easier to, to search for better work and it makes it easier to stay in work and, and get you know the next promotion to continue to develop your career. So there's this, so I, early, again, and this is why you know, I've been sort of really cheering on the sort of, uh, if you will, the second infrastructure policy and really hoping it become a reality. It's, it's the cent central to um, the Just Work uh, blueprint, as it were, um, it, it is this particular policy. But as you see, it, it, it disproportionately, or more generally, though, speaking, um, African-American women face no marriage penalty, right? Um, in part because so many African-American men are in prison, um, right? Right. So a central way, if you, you know, I guess this is one way of putting chapter four and chapter five together. But also for these people, the gender wage, the fact that uh, there's this tremendous inequality in the top of finance uh, between men and women, they can someone could see that as an injustice. I see it as injustice, but it matters more, matters less than than more than, than bring about more broad uh, gains to economic growth, because women, again, and women of color in particular, are disproportionately represented in lower wage work. Anything that elevates that work, that brings about a more inclusive sharing of the fruits of economic growth is gonna be central to just work feminism. So so let's talk a little bit, because uh, we do, we have just a few minutes left here, um, about some of your ideas for reforms, um, some of the recommendations you make at the end of the book uh, for bringing about uh, just work for all. Good. So, I, you know, I have a, a list of things and one of the central, my central concerns when coming up with this list of reforms is, is I'm not presenting an ideal, a picture of an ideally just society. I'm not, I'm not, when I, each of these individual reform proposals offers the opportunity to make American society comparatively just in the status quo that doesn't depend on de adopting them all at the same time. So in a way, you might someone might think of it as a kind of a piecemeal approach, but really what I think this is is just consistent with the way the, the practice and politics of justice works, which is you take a set of principles and concerns that people have, including the dignity of work, just work, and you advocate for concrete changes in these different ways. And so I talk about, right, exactly, right? Not, not you know, because it's bringing us closer to the ideal per se, but because it's comparatively just in a society where we didn't adopt these reforms. Okay. So exactly um and so uh and what's good about that from a politics is that you don't sometimes trying to get perfect can actually take you further from better but anyway uh, i talk about that in the book we don't need to talk about that here i'm going to kind of laundry list some of them uh some of the things i talk about but the main reform i so i talk about at least eight different sorts of reforms one is public child care and early child education tax reform the evolution of american tax code is a moral disaster um, you know, is, is society has become increasingly winner take all. We've used our tax code to throw gasoline on the fire of these winner take all trends um, and, and, and magnify their impact. And in fact, in some cases, drive their impact through our reforms of the tax code. Um, reforms to collective bargaining. Um, 
ways there's all sorts of interesting work being done uh, by political scientists, sociologists, people across disciplines, economists on, on how to lower the costs of, of of collective bargaining and how to how to strengthen how to make it easier for uh, for for workers in general to have comparative have have more say and more power. So I talk about reforms to that, including reforms to corporate governance, um, industrial policy. Uh, right. The, the, there should be a sort of a, you know, I argue for a variety of technological change is not just justice neutral. Right. There are much more labor friendly or uh, labor unfriendly uh, forms of technological uh, change. Um, much of the part of what makes American society increasingly winner take all is a lot of the biggest uh, sort of like shakers, movers and shakers uh, in, in in industry, a lot of the sort of the largest growing segments in the economy don't really require much by way of workers. Um, you know, this transition from a manufacturing economy to an intangibles economy for all sorts of reasons I talk about uh, in the text um, raises particular challenges. But even with respect to innovation and automation, and again, I sent, I cite, you know, works by Jerome Simoglu and others, uh, you know, there are more labor friendly changes. One thing I talk about in the book, but I, I kind of want to underline, and it's one of the things I'll talk more about in one of the many projects I'm working on right now, is, is the role of federal jobs guarantee um, might play. Um, you know, one of the interesting, one of the things I didn't see coming uh, necessarily when I was writing last spring, spring 2020, is, is this rising wages and rising bargaining power of workers to a certain extent. That is, I didn't see um, this and, and it may just be a short-lived phenomenon where either because of the pandemic, either people are rethinking work and their priorities or because, you know, government's done something in the last, particularly in the last several months, um, that it, it, it hasn't done much in my lifetime, which is it adopted policy that strengthened the bargaining power of workers um, by, you know, by making, by extending unemployment insurance and making it more robust, right, among other things. Lots of people don't like that. Um, uh, they want workers to be comparatively desperate and powerlessness, but powerless. But one of the ways and the effects the impact, are pretty spotty, right? Exactly. But nonetheless, you are still seeing some wages increase in certain in certain segments. Um, federal jobs guarantee can do something like that in spades. Um, it can it can it can tackle sort of two sort of different sections of 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 just work. It tackles both the you know, by tightening the labor market, increasing the bargaining power of workers, it, it it tends to bring about a more equal sharing of the fruits of economic growth. But it also mitigates domination and hierarchy in the workplace. Right? If one has good quality opportunities outside of their current job, um, then they are less subject to you know, as a as a relational egalitarian or a neo Republican political philosopher would say, they're less subject to the domination or arbitrary power of their workers. Right? So. So a jobs guarantee is a, is a, is something I talk about uh, in the book, but I might have underlined is is pretty close to a first best uh, way to uh, further just work uh, in the status quo. I also talk about infrastructure. Uh, you know, a big a big part of the decline to uh, to just work is is rooted in failing to you know provide infrastructure jobs and then, then to keep our infrastructure up to date. But also another another one is just the rapidly rising. Uh, cost of healthcare, which functions as a kind of wage suck uh, throughout much of the economy. Um, and, you know, there's a, you know, all, all of my work in theory and practice of justice is sensitive to path dependence. Um, and path dependence makes healthcare reform challenging. Um, but, you know, anything that can, that can work to, to s separate the, this link between employment and access to healthcare and do so in a way that not just that doesn't just leave millions of people without healthcare at all uh, would be uh, would be a big step forward for just work. Recognizing that just work is not just concerned with wages, it's also concerned with security. Uh, and in fact, in many cases, uh, American public philosophy Americans are more concerned with having a, a fair amount of security. Yeah, well, healthcare in general, in particular, but also just with security, with being able to make the basic needs of their family than they are with their ability to rise to the top through their own efforts. Right, so a, pub, a public philosophy for that best captures America's deeply held convictions, but also a public philosophy that's better suited to a winner-take-all economy is is one that secures uh, these basic needs for everyone, uh, 
you know, who, who's willing to work for them. Um, and so, so, you know, anything we can do to, to, uh, to make these parts of a middle-class existence not depend upon the sorts of employment that the sorts of jobs that are fewer and further between in a winner take all economy is likely to further just work. Very good. Well, Joshua Price, thank you so much for your time today. Um, once again, the book is Just Work for All, The American Dream in the 21st Century, uh, uh, out on Rutledge. Um, it's a terrific book if you have a chance. And um, my name is Tom DeSena, and this has been the New Books Network. <laughs>